So basically, the shit they don't tell you about international basketball. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's right. That's the shit they don't tell you, man. There's a ton. They, they'll put that, hey, look, we got 250000 we got 500000 we got a million or whatever. Sign it. But the shit they don't tell you is real and it's there. So I'm extremely excited about our guest today. Uh, but before I introduce him, I want to just share a couple of his accomplishments. He was the first player ever to top 600 points in one season with over 2,289 points, ninth best in 2010. I mean, to score that many points in a season, I mean, yo, he, he's, he's traveled the world. He, he, has, he, goes, he has a nickname. Now, if you're an, a professional athlete and, and you get a nickname, that means you're doing something. They call him freeze because he, he he freezes you on the court. He got that ice in his veins, all that cool stuff that the kids always say. And so without further ado, I want to introduce a good friend of mine. He's my brother. We're actually family. Mr. Keith Freeze Langford. How you doing, man? Man, I'm I'm doing great, man. I'm very, very glad to be here, man. Uh looking forward to chopping it up with you, bro. And uh Man, I'm I'm very, very excited to get this get this going with you, man. Definitely, man. So I appreciate you hopping on. I know you've been crisscrossing the country, getting ready uh, right. uh, and training for the season coming up. But more importantly, before we jump into your story, man, who is Keith Langford? I mean, I know they're familiar with you playing, you know, at Kansas. You had a very decorated uh, uh, career at Kansas. But let's start from the beginning. Who is Keith Langford? So you know, uh, Keith Langford is is everybody else. You know, I'm 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 no different, man. Uh, from Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, you know, came from solid background. Um, you know, grew up with, without a lot of things that um, you know kids kids need uh, that kids want um, in their childhood. But man, I had uh, I had my family. I had uh, both of my parents, even though they weren't married. Uh, they both were a presence in my life, uh, raised me, got me involved in sports, taught me the values, taught me about hard work, taught me about uh, not making excuses. And, uh, you know, from there, man, I used that, jumped into my career and uh, just, you know, started a path, man, is just trying to stay as solid as possible. And, uh, you know, took on the moniker of being great where I was. And no matter what that was, whether it was college, whether it was Europe, whether it was uh, business, ventures and endeavors. I just always tried to be great in the moment and, and where I was, man. So Keith Lambert is no different than anybody else. I'm just like everyone else. But, you know, I've I've taken the tools that I've learned along the way and applied them to the best of my ability. man. Definitely, man. Thank you for sharing that. Now, let's talk about being from Fort Worth. Yeah. A lot of people uh, confuse that with uh, Dallas. Oh, man. Can you, can you can you clear that up for the people uh, out there? So <laughs> Not familiar with that, so man. the best the best way I can explain it is, uh, you know, it's like asking somebody from Kansas the difference between Kansas City Mo and Kansas City Kansas. Mm. You know, like it's a distinct difference. You know, like Dallas and Fort Worth, it is DFW, it's the Metroplex. But if you if you're from Dallas and you come to Fort Worth and you're from Fort Worth and you go to Dallas, they can smell it on you. You know, what <laughs> I mean? like there's, there's a distinct difference, man. You know, it's uh, the lingo, the style of dress, the attitude, uh, everything. So I'm from the Fort Worth side, um, not from Dallas. So, uh, but, you know, Fort Worth gets uh, the least of the attention of the two. Obviously, Dallas is well-known internationally, but uh, Fort Worth does have, uh, the people that are from there understand and know that Fort Worth has a really good history of of athletes and, and guys to come out and, and do well in the world. Definitely, definitely. So growing up, were you always an athlete? Was it was it natural for you? Was it something you grew into? And how'd you even get into sports? Good question. So um, it, it was. I mean, I did the same thing everyone else did. You know, went outside and you know played two two hand touch and and played in the streets and and did all of those things. But um, I never really was uh, uh, thought of myself as an athlete. Uh, but you know, I give my mom credit because one day uh, we hopped in the car. And no idea where we're going, but she dropped us off at a uh, Pee Wee football. Mm. Me and my brother dropped us off at Pee Wee football, and so from there, man, I instantly I fell in love with with playing football. And uh, you know, Texas is a football state, and so yeah. my goal was to be 
a uh, football player at, at that at that point in time. I was going to play college and go to the NFL and do all that. Basketball was nowhere. Wow, in my space, man. So I was I was hooked on football from about eight years old. Um, and yeah, that was that was that was really what I wanted to do. So it, I give credit to my mom, man. She dropped me off that first day, and you know I was hooked. And then, so when did the basketball transition start? Uh, so basketball came about, I was in the seventh grade. And, um, man, so, you know, played football, went through football season. And uh, we had moved, um, changed neighborhoods. And so I made this new group of friends. And so after basketball, I mean, after football season was over, uh, one day after school, all my guys, you know, instead of going to the bus stop, you know, they – they make a different turn in their head to the gym. I'm like, where y'all going? It was like, man, basketball tryouts today. Oh, I'm like, oh, I, I guess I'm going too. So followed them, went to basketball tryouts, man. And um, I had played basketball before, obviously, up until that point. But that was my first experience with organized um, sports. And so went in there, man. And uh, literally from <laughs> just – and it's, it's, it's interesting because both of my parents would play college basketball. Right. So – for me not to have that natural feel right away or not have been into the game and playing it was, was, uh, is, is, is interesting to look back on now, but at the time, though, man, I just wanted to be around my friends. So followed them in the tryouts and, and it started from there. You still cool with those guys to this day? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I was just texting one of them before, uh, before I started the, the podcast, man. So yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with all those guys. We, every time I'm in Fort Worth once, twice, three times a year, I mean, they, they, I definitely link up with them. Do they ever hit you with, man, if it weren't for me, you wouldn't be playing. Would they ever hit you with that you one? Know, I, <laughs> the funny thing about that story is, I mean, the, the, the cliche is actually true. One of uh, Clarence Williams, I'll give a shout out to C. Right. He's um he's actually the guy that when he went on, now he was the guy, right? Like this is, everybody has that story about the one guy that, man, he was better than whoop, whoop, and he did this if you would have saw him. But Clarence was actually, was my, um, my best friend. And, um, he gets invited to an AAU team tryout. Mm. And uh, he's like, Keith, man, uh, it's it's not an open tryout, but, man, just come with me because I don't want to go by myself. I'm a little bit nervous. Wow. So I'm like, all right, I'll go. You know, so this is – at this time, this is the summer going into 10th grade, ninth grade summer. And um, I go with him. And the crazy thing about it, man, is that I go in the tryout. And, I mean, long story short, they end up keeping me and not him. So, wow. so it really kind of like, you know, we, we joke about it now, but I mean, the truth of the matter is, is like without him, I would have never been, I would have never been in that space because I wasn't on, I was nowhere on the radar and had I not win that tryout and made the team and started, started my AAU career, man, this, I, I don't see any of this happening. So per basketball terminology, you were a late bloomer, would you? Would yes, you sir. That's exactly. A late wow. bloomer. I would classify anyone that's uh, that's not that doesn't have that story. Of, oh, I've been playing since I was four or five. Or anybody who hit a late growth spurt, late maturity, um, got what it got into their perspective sport late and became very successful very quickly. Definitely. So from that point, you go to the AAU tournament. You're the one that gets invited. Uh, when did you start taking it serious? When you were like, "Damn, I, I probably could really do this." Right. So. Uh, so that uh, so tenth grade so the first summer I was on the summer circuit so it's, it's crazy to think back so this is the summer of ninety eight crazy wow uh, <laughs> summer of ninety eight going into ninety nine ninety nine um, I I played during the summer and I'm like <clears throat> and I started to understand rankings and I started to understand um, that you know uh, recruiting and and different things like that and so. Um, and I started to notice that a lot of the people that I was playing against that were highly ranked or already being recruited or already committed to certain schools that, man, I'm just as good as him or I'm, I'm better than him. Right. So at that point I was like, ah, oh, okay. Like I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go D1 too. Cause at that time, I think I got a few junior college letters or something like that. But, um, and then I was like, oh no, I'm going D1. And so at that point, once I saw that my peers and the people that I was next to that the monster wasn't as scary once I stood up and looked it in the eyes. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, uh, this is this is for me. Wow. So would you say that you had developed a certain attitude, a certain mindset, you changed your thinking, and that was one of the things that helped give you the confidence? Absolutely. That's, I mean, I, I, I have nothing to add to that because that's that's exactly what happened. Without, without even realizing what was going on, that's exactly what happened. 
Well, what, what would you say that came from? Uh, you know, I, man, so uh, so my my household was always very competitive. You know, like um, three bo- three boys in the house. Yeah, and all of you guys are athletes. Yeah, all, <laughs> like, nah, I got the short end of the stick, man. They're both 6'8". I'm 6'3". So, I, right. so, yeah, so, I mean, my brothers, man, and, like, um, you know, competing with them and everything from – who's going to drink his water or soda the fastest or who's going to finish their cereal the quickest, the racing up and down the street, all of those things like that competitive nature. And then I had a mom that was no holes barred. Like I told that story about trying out for my middle school uh, basketball team. And but, so when I come home and tell my mom that I want to play, the first thing she does, she looks at me very seriously. And she's like, Hey, well, you need to get better. You know, like I had a mom that was very, Matter of fact, and very, you know, so I always understood and grasped, you know, if I'm going to do it, like I got to really do it, and I really need to be serious about this and be better. And so from that, and then obviously my dad, um, I mean, I spend the time with him. I watched countless New York Nick games and watched him play countless pickup games, and I can remember, you know, holding my eyes like this a couple times because he's so competitive out there. He's about to get in the fight. <laughs> you know, with, with people. And so as a kid sitting there watching your dad on the playground going, playing like his game seven of the Eastern finals. Is, you know, like, <laughs> my dad's a Bronx native. So, I mean, you know, that, that, that's in his blood. So, so that's, it's, it's a mixture of all of those things, man. Definitely. No. So they held you accountable. And I think that's been like the reoccurring theme that, I, that I've noticed with a lot of people who've amassed uh, this certain level of success is that they had someone that held them accountable, even without them knowing it. It was like done unconsciously. And then, of course, I always say accountability really just breeds responsibility. And so having that work ethic and different things like that, because to be an athlete at the top level, and then we'll go into, you know, your college career. Talk about that level of responsibility that it takes, because you have to want to be great. You know, the early work, the early workouts, staying in the weight room. Uh, I'm not sure if you had to watch what you eat. The constant, you know, training of your your free throws, your jump shot, right. the layups. Right. Talk about that level of discipline that was needed. Man, I I, I saw a quote, um, and man, I, I cannot remember where I saw it, and I can't find it anymore. But uh, where exactly I saw it? But it was it said that discipline will always take you further than motivation. Mm. So, and the discipline of of knowing what you want to be and and being consistent and showing up and doing that day after day after day. Like is, I you know it's 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 exponential, man. Because and I say that because motivation it can get you through a couple games, it can th- get you through a couple possessions, it can get you through, you know, a, a, a couple months even or or a season, you know what I mean, or something like that. But if you're disciplined, and uh, you know, I saw that right away, and so I I had I had really good high level teammates, I had Hall of Fame coaching, uh, Roy Williams, Bill Self. Um, and so it was always around me. And so just like you said, that accountability, because Coach Williams' standard was here. Coach Self's standard was here. Yeah. Drew Gooden's standard was here, like lottery picks. Um, you know, the history of the, my teammates, the players around me. Uh, the, it was it – was, I, I was fortunate enough to go into an environment to where, I mean, there was nothing less expected. Uh, there was nothing less – that you could do, like you had to get here or you were going to get left behind. And once I saw that, I wasn't going to get left behind because just the way I explained before that I'm here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get busy. Like it's, it's in me. Like, this is how I'm gonna... Yeah. And I, I, I talk, I even touched a little bit on that, how you talked about motivation being temporarily. Mm. I use the same terminology when I talk about passion. Passion mm. is for amateurs. <laughs> like you have to be disciplined and because it wears off. It's like going to the motivational workshop. Right. Like you can go to the motivational workshop. You're motivated. Yeah. Reality usually sets in 24 to 48 hours <laughs> once you leave that. And so, yeah, that discipline of what you learn from that workshop has to continue to carry you. And so I think that's a lot what people need to hear because I've been in dialogue with people and they're like, oh, well, my spouse doesn't motivate me or mm. I'm not around people who motivate you. No, you got to do that shit yourself. That's right. You need to have the discipline because right. then once you're disciplined, you will be motivated. You know, no, no, I, I, absolutely. Uh, well, yeah. I, I agree. And because even like using basketball, like the thing with like 
you would think that everybody who goes into that setting would see this greatness and 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 use that same discipline, but it's not. Like a lot of guys do get left behind, and what ends up happening is they recruit right over you. There's another guy that's that's coming in, and it's and, it, and it's just a cycle. And so if you're not careful, and if you don't uh, exhibit those traits, you will get left behind, man. And so yeah, I'm 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 definitely all about discipline. Um, now I, I'm not. I don't want to talk down on motivation, or I don't want to talk right, down right, on passion. Or anything like that, but I mean, like you said, it's, it's temporary, and the discipline, the people around you, they can't help you, but it's not their it's not their responsibility. I think. Hundred percent. Like I always tell people, you don't know what motivated me, Keith, when I didn't get to eat for three days. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quick way to motivate your ass right, to go out right, there and be right. disciplined and work. <laughs> That's right. Listen, I'm, I'm telling you, listen. That's I mean, it's same thing. Like um, your failures are are what should you know, uh, help you out. Like for me, like, you know, from high school to college was relatively easy. Like I really didn't have any, any, um, you know, adversity, um, you know, maybe a bad game or here or here or something like that, an injury or something, but adversity really hit once I left college and on draft night, my name wasn't called. Right. Well, was like, before we get to that, cause I, I definitely want to talk about yeah, let's go. some of those things, but let's, let's, let's go to, to college. You're at KU. Okay. Yeah. You're at Kansas. That's a big time school, man. Right. Yeah. Like, like, how? Did, what was that? What it was that feeling like to 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 go to a college that was that decorated? I mean, it had history. Like, yeah. what was that feeling like, man? It's uh, it was it was surreal, man. Because I can remember being in high school one time and watching Kansas play Prairie View A and M in the NCAA tournament. Now we weren't even watching the game for Kansas. We were watching because. Damn, PV's in the NCAA tournament. Right. They just happened to be playing Kansas. And I remember looking and I was like, yo, what is what is what is that? What is going on? Like, yeah. like that, it seemed like it was something that how do you even get there? How do you do that? You know? And that that was that was the way it felt. And even initially before committing to Kansas, I was uh I originally committed to Ole Miss. Oh so, wow. Yeah, I was in the 11th grade, man. I committed to the running rebels. And, uh, you know, I've I've been being recruited by lower tier schools and Ole Miss from the SEC was the first one to kind of jump out there and say, no, we think this kid has some has a chance. And so in my mind, I automatically, you know, downplayed myself and was thinking, oh, man, well, at least if I go to Ole Miss, I can play against Kentucky or I can play against the big schools in the SEC. Like this is my chance, man. And then so from there. I kept playing, kept getting better, thinking I'm preparing myself to play against the Kentuckys. But the better I played, the more the more I played and preparing myself to play against those big schools, the big schools started taking notice of me. Right. And then, so finally, at one point, uh, I get the phone call. My high school, I'm, I'm back in my school. My high school coach walks in the gym. He's like, hey, man, uh, Cincinnati, Arizona, Kansas, and OU just called today. He was like, man, what the hell you been doing out there? You know, like, that was... <laughs> His exact thing. And then from there, I was like, and I, I'm not even realizing, man, I'm just I'm just so focused on I need to get better. I want to be as good as I could possibly be. And all of that stuff just, it started coming, man. I, mm-hmm. I literally, I never thought once about Kansas. I never thought once about Cincinnati. I never thought once about Arizona. I never thought once about all these schools. I just was focused on being as good as I could possibly be. And then when all of that stuff started coming, and then like I started going on these visits, and now I'm sitting, now I'm, in Allen Fieldhouse and I'm sitting in Coach Williams' basement talking to his wife and eating barbecue and doing all this stuff. And I'm like, yo, this is this is insane because a year and a half ago, you know, I'm, I, there's no way I even could conceptualize being in this position. But the fact that it was real and the fact that I was there, the one thing that's not surprising to me was like, yeah, I'm supposed to be here. And that, and that was one thing I remember. It was like, I'm here. Yeah, I'm good enough to do this. And so uh, once once I got over the initial like, wow, like I'm here in the university, I'm here at the school, man. I was just so confident in the work that I had been doing that I wasn't overwhelmed. Wow. And, and, now you said something or you said a lot of things that really stuck <laughs> out. But yeah. the thing that that that's really stuck sticking with me is that you really started to change how you were thinking. You wasn't focused on the result. You were just right. focused on the process. Yes, sir. And yes, so. Sir. And I think that's something that people really need to hear because a lot of times we're like, man, I need to get in position so I can be a millionaire. Right. And you should be focused on just the discipline of doing the work and the millions to come. 
of course, you're going to need the right vehicles. And it's a lot of other things that go into that. And so uh, I think that that's really important. Be so because now you prepare for that. You're at Kansas and now you're playing against the Syracuse. You're playing against the Marquettes and yeah. like you played against probably almost most of the Hall of Famers that are going to be inducted or already yeah, inducted definitely. from definitely. the Carmelos to the D ways. Like, what was that feeling like be, to be in that class of individuals? You know, uh, it's interesting, man, because at the time, obviously, right, you don't know that Dwayne Wade and Carmelo Anthony are going to be Hall of Famers, right? You don't, you don't really grasp um, the concept of some of the people that you're playing against, but so, you know, they're, they're just your peers. And so, like I said, like, you're so focused on yourself and what your team is doing that you don't have time to think about anybody else. And it's, it's, the, it's the damnedest thing because if anybody would go to YouTube right now and type in Kansas versus Marquette 2003 NCAA Final Four, like, you're like, hold on, this guy out here, number five for Kansas, is is treating treating playing against D Wade like playing against anybody else. But that's right. That's you know, like obviously, I knew he was a good player, and I knew he was. But like I said, I was just so locked in and focused on what I was doing and what I was trying to accomplish that, like, I just all the outside noise and everything was going on. It it, it didn't register. So now, you know, twenty years later, I can look back and appreciate and say, damn, like, okay. I was there and like I was toe to toe with these guys. And now it makes sense why he was able to get to the top of his craft and be a Hall of Famer. And like why I was able to get to the top and be where where I, I've gotten to in, in my career. So, um, you know, I, I don't compare and uh, and I don't envy or whatever, but, you know, I respect, you know, what, what my counterparts were able to accomplish. And looking back on it, man, I'm I'm extremely grateful and thankful because that was really really special man and i can only now can i appreciate how special it was 20 years later definitely man no thank you for sharing that so we get to draft night yeah uh, you know you say your name's not called right. and, and you know because a lot of times again people just see keith up here right. they may not know like what you were going through through that time and and so what was that feeling like you know you've amassed and you felt levels of success, you know, mm -hmm. extremely recognized throughout college. Right, um, right. I mean, I'm pretty sure you can walk nowhere on campus <laughs> without signing autographs. Like, mm -hmm. that's a lot to take on as a 17, 18 year old. And so uh, draft night comes. What was that feeling like? A lot of, a lot of mixed emotions, man. Um, so here's the thing, one thing I learned, like, so when, like, draft night comes and so I, I, I'd had some injuries. Um, and, you know, one valuable lesson I learned was, you know, you have you can't be afraid to take risks and strike while the iron's hot because that final four that I'm describing playing against Dwayne Wade and, and Carmelo Anthony and ultimately losing to Carmelo and Syracuse. Um, my sophomore year, I was a projected first round draft pick, but I wasn't ready. I was hesitant. I was thinking that, oh, well, you know, I could just do it next year and this and that. And. I literally, during the Final Four in New Orleans, man, was had agents calling the hotel room. And um, I mean, I, I literally was like, you know, it was like, okay, well, what are you going to do? Like, you need to come out, like you're using that, whatever. So, but I said no. And my fear, my apprehension, I should say, um, you know, like put me in a difficult spot. So then I ended up coming back the next season and then which uh, started, and I, I was going to play the next season and then enter the draft after my junior year go through my junior year. At the end of my junior year, we're in an Elite Eight playing against Georgia Tech, Jared Jack, uh, Will Bynum, really, really good team. We're in an Elite Eight playing against them. Five minutes away from going to uh, our third straight Final Four, and I hurt my knee. And then, which starts a streak of three knee surgeries in 10 months. Mm. So, going into my senior year, don't play well. I'm hobbled. My numbers are down. It doesn't look like the first three years that I've been playing. So, um, draft night was mixed emotions because I couldn't help but think that, man, I should have taken the opportunity when it was there. My apprehension and my fear has led me to this moment where, like, I'm expressing I'm having this big failure. But to be honest, I can't even be mad at the teams for not taking me because there was a time when I should have struck and, and made the decision when, you know, it was more in line for me. So that's going through my mind. But at the same time, I'm still hoping that I get drafted 
And at the same time, I'm extremely sad and I'm confused because I don't know which way is up. Like everything had pretty much been come natural for me and was easy. And then how here I am, um, you know, 21 years old, undrafted. And, you know, I, I don't have a job. I don't know what's next. So very, very confusing and difficult time with mixed emotions. Definitely. Did that change? Fast forwarding now, did that change your outlook on how you look at opportunities and how you analyze things that may come across your plate now? Um, you know what? It it, it changed because it, it was the first time I didn't know. You know, I, the unknown was really there. Like, I didn't like, like what do, because you got to think, now this is 2005. So the, the information and being able to just up in Google Europe or understanding the concept that there was somewhere else to play basketball really wasn't wasn't there. So in my mind, like I was stepping into the abyss, like complete unknown territory. So man, I, um, I really, you know, was at at rock bottom from a, from a career standpoint, um, at that point. And like, but, and looking back on it now, I have to give credit to my support group, my mom, my brothers, man, my family, like my mom was, I mean, incredibly strong and, and positive and reinforcing that, you know, I still have value. And I still would be able to find myself. And that that kind of helped recharge the batteries. Definitely. And that support system is important because a lot of times we can go through things and we could doubt ourselves, but we have people around us see, who see more in us than we may see in ourselves at the time. And sometimes mm. that's all you need. Yes. Yes. Somebody just to say, you know what, get up off your ass. You 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 are good enough to do this. Right. And sometimes right. we do need that tough love and that tough talking like that. Not the whole, oh, poor yeah. baby. Like no, 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 right, right. And one, and one thing I do want to say, and, and I would encourage people to be careful of, is that when somebody does give you that speech and they see something that you don't see in yourself, don't fight that person on it. Mm. I've, I've been in situations where like that, where, well, hey, you can be, you can still make it to the NBA. You, man, no, no, I can't, man. Well, it's going to always, I always have an excuse or there's always a reason why to why what the other person is saying won't work. And that is the worst thing that you can possibly do and is the most counterproductive thing. So even if you don't agree, it's best to just not get in your own way and sit in silence and listen. So I would encourage anybody not to refute or go up against the the person that's trying to help you because it's, it's hard enough out here as it is. No, definitely, man. So let's, 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 you know, uh, transition here a little bit. So okay. you, um, uh, go through the draft process. Uh, it didn't happen the way you want it to happen. Uh, you, you know, end up playing on a couple NBA teams and then you find international basketball. Yes, but sir. before you, before we go into that, I, w- I want to talk a little bit about, you know, just the personal story. You know, uh, you got a chance to come out to Vegas. We <laughs> ended up meeting each other. You know, we have, uh, you know, uh, some yeah. family, uh, together. You actually are uh, married to, to my cousin right. and it was like, you know, I always just appreciated you because it was just like you were just Keith to me, you right. know, at yeah. the time we met. But you actually got to see me at the beginning of my journey. Yes. And we actually yes. just shared a story recently when I was in Austin. You was like, man, I was at the beginning of my journey, too. You just didn't right. know. So right. Right. Like, just talk about, you know, just how that was where, you know, just the 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 natural organicness that not only we built, but, you know, we both almost kind of came up together in that. In yeah, that absolutely. Right. So I, I I gotta tell the story first of all, like, um, <laughs> <laughs> like man, we are, you know, I mean, they introduce, Brittany introduces my wife introduces me, says, oh, you know, my cousin and he's from Milwaukee and you know he's got you know the best mouthpiece in the world and he's connected <laughs> out here in Vegas and he knows everybody and so I'm like you know he show you a good time I'm like okay great cool and so. And then, uh, you know, we link up and it's like, man, you know, want to hang out, get out for a little while. So you take me and my summer league teammates and you're like, oh, we're going to go to uh, this club in Caesars Palace called Poetry. <laughs> like, all right, man, cool. So, you know, I, I get the Steve Madden's laced up, right? You know what I'm saying? I get the... Uh... <laughs> I think my suit was baggy. I don't know what I had. Oh, oh man, it definitely was baggy. We we baggy, <laughs> crazy baggy. I got the um. I mean, yeah, man. So I got. I'm I'm Steve Madden and all the down. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> I got it all. Like, <laughs> so, man. You know, man. Listen, I don't know how we had no business getting into that spot, man. I don't know how you pulled it off to this day. Like, yo, man, my man. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> I'm sitting there like I want to get in. Right. He's about to get us in, but I ain't got no money to party when we get in here. 
But I remember, man, just recently I told you, I said, man, I had maybe $400 in the account. Right. And I'm thinking like, and then your response to me is like, well, man, if you had 400, I had 40. <laughs> <laughs> so we, both, we had no, but look, man, but when you talk about an organic development to a relationship, man, like neither one of us had ego. Right. And we were just in a space. So man, like we wanted to have a good time. We wanted to build, man. I mean, I remember even back then, man, you were shooting me the advice on paralegal and, and how to, how to, what kind of steps to move on. And I mean, I remember you giving me the story about, I mean, coming out to Vegas and being in a weekly. And I just remember like, damn, like this dude, excuse my language, got balls, man. Come out here with, with no bread and just, and to be in this point, like it's, it's a really vulnerable space, man. And so, and we were kind of like on the same wavelength, man, because it's a very vulnerable space at the same time too. People may look at NBA Summer League as a prestigious thing, but no, man, it's really a vulnerable space because you don't have a contract. You're on a team where uh, you're supposed to be playing with guys in a type of synergy, but at the same time, you're competing with them mm -hmm. for the roster spot or for the attention of another team. So it's a very vulnerable position to be in. You don't know who to trust, don't know who to talk to, don't know really who's in, in your favor. And, and at the same time, you don't have a contract. So you're, you're in limbo. And so, man, it, it was great all those years ago, man, to be able to have that escape and have that that um, that bond and that, like you said, an organic bond that, that we were able to develop at that time because it was Definitely. it was necessary and it, it was needed, man. Definitely, man. And, I, and, I, like when, and when we finally did get in the club, I don't know how we got in VIP. I don't, I don't even, we, we probably shared a drink. I don't even know. It's like. <laughs> no, hey, but we was in there though. We were, dead, we were in <laughs> VIP. We was behind that rope. Right, right. Man, That's all that counts. Nothing, man. I think I still got that picture too, man. Oh, uh, please send it to me. Bro. I gotta find it, man. I definitely gotta find it, man. So, so yeah. So you go through that transition. Uh, you, you, and now you find international uh, basketball. Yeah. And I often tell people that, and I, I mean, not me, but this is you know uh, documented. One of the most successful and recognized international athletes uh, in basketball. Like, how does that feel, you know, coming from when you kind of doubted yourself that you can even be a high caliber player in the NBA to now you transition to international basketball and you're you're the most recognized athlete over there just in that entire space. That's a big deal. Right. It, it is. And so and going back to kind of what I alluded to earlier, like I had to be careful because in the beginning I I knocked myself down a couple of spaces. Mm -hmm. So meaning that like, man, OK, well you're the best player in Europe, but you're not in the NBA. And so my mind would be playing tricks on me, saying stuff like that to myself. So I had to get out of my own way with that too, man. Like, no, you. this means something. This is important. Like your success, you put the work in, you climb this ladder. And uh, man, and so being in that space, man, like it, I'm so appreciative of it because like, I really had to get this out of the mud. You know, um, I was on a trajectory that, um, you know, I could have possibly been in the NBA, but when I was, you know, quote unquote, left for dead and the game had pretty much chewed me up and spit me out, I, I was able to find a place in Europe or international basketball that, um, that I didn't even recognize it at the time, that I initially looked at as a failure, man, it became my saving grace and is the thing that is going to allow, that has allowed me to provide for my family, take my immediate, like my, my children, will be millionaires when, when they become of age. And it's allowed a different level of life and exposed me to a entirely different mental space and, and, and cultures and people that otherwise I would have never ever known or never even appreciated or knew it exists, man. So I have such an uh, appreciation for Europe and I'm able to appreciate Europe and the things that I've done there without, you know, uh, saying anything bad about NBA or that you don't need the NBA or whatever. I still love the NBA as well, just like anybody. But Europe uh, was definitely a saving grace for me, and I'm such an appreciative of, of my time there. Definitely. It's been, what, 14 years? Man, not so – yeah, so 16 years. Guitar, yeah, so, man, this year, 15 years, man. Wow. 15, 17, I mean, that, yeah. that itself is an accomplishment. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, 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 I, and I think and, – and I know you – think this way as well but you know i just want to continue to give you your flowers that that's an accomplishment man Thank i you, mean man. to be able to do anything for a decade at a high level yes. i mean what's the average basketball professionally playing career is what four to five years 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, yeah, I would say that, especially at, at a high level, definitely. Yeah, high. so for you to have, you know, still play at such a high level, I mean, extremely well-respected, not just, you know, internationally, but even in the States. So having a global presence, man, I definitely salute you because that takes a certain level of discipline. It you does. Know, that takes a certain level of, of self-belief. That takes a certain level of being responsible because you still have to be accountable because as you get older, your body reacts differently. Mm-hmm. You'd be That's like, right. man, I don't feel like getting on the right. going to the weight room. I don't feel That's like right. this and that. And so for you to still have that level of discipline going into your 15th career, you know, I definitely salute you, man, and, and just applaud because, you know, that that just shows because I know there was adversity, even though you've played at the, the levels you've played at, you know, whether it's been, you know, having bad games, whether you're away from your family, whether, mm-hmm. you know, you feel sick, like you still have a responsibility to yourself. Absolutely. And, and, and your team and, and et cetera. Like, do you want to touch a little bit on that briefly? Just, you know, yeah, um, I, I think, uh, you know, like I said, with, with, obviously with anything, there's going to be adversity, but I really think um, being able, like I, I, my mentor that I ended up meeting um, over in Europe, uh, he, he taught me the concept of, you know, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Mm. So, um, and man, you know, uh, and he taught me the concept of investing in myself. So even at the point where I had reached and I, I reached, you know, seven figure contracts and I was making a name for myself, here was a guy that came in and told me, no, you need to be doing more. And, uh, if you want to keep doing this and you want to keep going, this is how you do it. And I listened, even though, you know, it wasn't easy and I wasn't necessarily comfortable. Um, you know, he, kind of gave me a blueprint and, and what I started doing to the only reason why I feel like I am at this now 15 years in Europe, 17 years total um, point is I started, I started investing in a trainer. So mm-hmm. 50 grand a year, you know, for a trainer to travel with me, so uh, to take care of my, uh, take care of my body, take care of my meals, take care of different things like that. Like I just wasn't waking up every day and going out there. Now, a lot of people may think that, Oh man, well, it's, you know, it's just European basketball. It's not worth it. But no, like it had nothing to do with that. I said, if if this is what the best have, I'm going to have some version of that. And so I just believe in myself and I continue to invest in myself. And I just treated myself like the business. You know, that Jay-Z lyric, I'm not a businessman. I'm a businessman, you know, and that was that was the entire mentality. And so the ups and downs of adversity, lost contracts, um, like you said, injuries, um, bad performances, um, the, the stress of playing in a contract year, knowing that you need, you know, a deal for the next season, all of these things, um, you know, responsibility to taking care of people financially, all of that pressure, um, along with trying to be the best version of myself wasn't easy. And so, definitely, um, definitely. so I was able to get through it though, man. Definitely, man. So speaking of being a businessman, <laughs> let's, let's, let's pivot going into Keith, the entrepreneur. Yes. Ah. <laughs> Keith, the full-time CEO. Yes, like, what was dude. that first investment for you when you started saying, you know what? Uh, let me start looking at other avenues to really maximize my money. You know right. what I'm saying? Right, right. right. Okay, so the, the the very first thing that um that uh so like I got introduced to like money marketing account. So which is not a particular investment, but it was like you know, it was explaining the concept to me that, oh, you mean like my money's not going to be in cash? Like it's going to be like, right, right. Gonna be like in these different vehicles making certain kind of money. And so my, I had to get over my fear of, I'm just going to say, I mean, without being, you know, PC, like, you know, being black and coming from where you're from, like we want our money in our hand. I need to type it in and, and my money, I need to be able to see it. And so handing over money to be put in something that could shift up and down without my control was, was scary. And then I didn't understand the concept. And so buying into that and understanding, you know, the market or not even necessarily the market, but just understanding that being able, like letting go of the fear of putting my money somewhere else and and taking that risk and letting it do something for me was, was uh, like I said, money market and account was, was the very first thing, but as far as um, investments go, um, the the very first thing that I invested in was a uh, man. Believe it or not, it was a movie, and so oh, wow. uh, 
Did yeah, you start yeah. in it? Did you did you want to be in it? <laughs> <laughs> keep keep nah, getting it nah, 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 and everything. Nah, nah. Actually, it's 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 the it's the damnest thing, man, because it was a movie and um I remember being told they like, look like you know, there's just a certain amount, like people typically do this, they put in money and all that, and like, you know, you have the rights. And so like, now you're going to get, you know, every time this movie is the rights are bought from a, from a cable company or it's rented or whatever, like you're going to get residual income from it, man. So like, I mean, even now, like somewhere in my, in my dresser drawer, I got like a $1,200 check from a, a $30,000 investment I made 14 oh, years wow. ago. You know wow. So like, so that was the first thing that, that I did to where I said, oh, okay, investments, like, oh, this is, okay, I like these kind of moves or I like these kind of plays. And so um, was was risky. Like, I, I wouldn't advise people to invest in movies, but I mean, if, you know, but if uh, if you have the the capital and you believe in something, I'm definitely all for, for plays like that. Definitely, definitely. So you invested in a movie. Uh, what other things have you maybe invested in? Um, so, uh, real estate, uh, investing in real estate, the best invested in, uh, tequila. Um, I've invested in, uh, what else? Um, I've invested in, uh, sport companies. Uh, I invested in a, a sports agency. Um, I've invested in, um, so I'm, mean, yeah, like, I mean, a, a myriad of things, man, that, um, and like, you know, even, uh, uh, I've invested in, um, you know, construction companies and, you know, there's a, a lot of different things to where uh, either, you know, they were projects that I believed in or they were people I believed in uh, one or other. Like, so I try to be smart about it, but at the same time, um, you know, look for a good opportunity that benefit me economically. Definitely. So you invested in a few businesses, a few opportunities mm-hmm. that I remember you know, uh, back a few months back, you came out here to Las Vegas. Uh, mm-hmm. We sat down and had a talk. And you actually, even before this encounter, I remember you telling me about something you actually want to invest in for yourself. Yes. I don't yes. you remember this, this convo we had, but I came to Austin for one day about three, four years ago. Uh, remember, I was in Houston, Texas. Ah, you did. You came to the age. That's right. I okay. came to Austin okay. for a day. That's right. And you were telling me what you wanted to do. Yes. And I was like, man, you should do it and et cetera, et cetera. Fast That's forward crazy. four or five years later, you come out here to Vegas. Yeah. You start talking to me about some of the things you want to do. And I was like, man, you got to do that shit, man. Right. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So let's talk about, you know, your IBT, uh, you know, just briefly touch on, you know, uh, your new venture that you have coming up because see, now you're investing in you. This right. is your project. This is your baby. Uh, you know, if you want to just talk briefly about this new venture you have coming up. Okay. So, um, so IBT, like you said, is an acronym for International Basketball Transition Program. And uh, it, what it is, is that it is for any American athlete, basketball player that is transitioning to international play for the first time, Europe, China, uh, Philippines, whatever, Australia, all of this. And what it does is it helps facilitate um, a lot of the issues financially, lifestyle, culturally, anything for those athletes who struggle to adapt um, when, when, when they get overseas. And I developed it um, initially because, one, obviously my struggles and the things that I went through when I initially uh, went to Europe. And then two, uh, like I said, just going back to the same concept of, of myself, right? If whatever the top of the, the best of the best have, I need to have a version of that as well. And in the NBA, they have what's called RTP, Rookie Transition Program, where they take all of the first first year NBA players and they take them, they fly them out to New York and they teach them about uh, how to handle their money, what, what it's like to be a professional, how, how their life is about to change. So the concept is just to do the same thing with athletes. Uh, basketball players that are doing the doing it in Europe, and so uh, it's something that uh, literally, man, it's 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 imperative because of the thousands upon thousands of people who play basketball in the states, Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, junior college, D League, uh, semi pro leagues, and all of that. Um, there's only 450 spots in the NBA, and everyone else will, if they want to play basketball for a living, will have to transition internationally to do so. And the program is there designed to uh, 
help you make this transition easier so you protect your contract, your agent's investment is is uh, his agent fees and uh, investment is protected. The team is protected from the product that they're getting. Um, so we're trying to cover all of these bases and give everybody the maximum, the, you know, the most bang for the buck and make it as seamless uh, a process as possible while also teaching some of these guys the ins and outs from the business side so they don't get screwed uh, financially because there is that that aspect as well. Definitely. So basically the shit they don't tell you about international basketball. <laughs> there you go. That's right. That's the shit they don't tell you, man. There's a ton. They, they'll they put that, hey, look, we got 250000 we got 500000 we got a million or whatever. Sign it. But the shit they don't tell you is real and it's there. And this is what, and the IBT is there to give you that heads up. Yeah. Just one thing I did want to talk about in regard to that is like one of the things they don't tell you is most people that go play international, they have a misconception that they don't have to pay taxes on that money. Mm. Like mm. where, where, where did that come from? Like, how did that even you know, become I, something? I, I have no idea, bro. But I'm going to tell you, like, like, listen, when I first went to Europe in 06, 07, they told me the same thing. Wow. So I'm, I'm getting over there thinking, yeah, my first contract, Europe, 2006, 2007, I signed a 160K contract and I'm thinking, Oh man, I, this is all mine. Like I'm good. I got this. I, I, I. And come to find out, you know, long story short, without getting in a lot, like the the you don't pay taxes overseas is not true. Um, you know, just to give a little bit of game. The uh, and also there's a rumor out there that uh, anything 100k you don't have to pay tax on. Also not true. Whatever tax bracket that you're in in America, like the law says that you can't pay tax on money twice, right? Which is true. But however. Um, if your team, if you're playing in a country where the tax rate is lower than what your tax rate is as an American citizen, you're always on the hook for what the difference is. Wow. So, and, and then if you're dealing with the team that's trying to pay you and you can't prove that they've paid tax on it in their respective country, when you bring that money back over to America, um, you're on the hook for all of the tax. So I've seen it, man. Um, you know, I, I don't want to put anyone's business out on the street, but multiple guys, multiple guys. I mean, I just read about a guy that played in China, made 13 million during his career, and the IRS was on his doorstep last month. Wow. Um, another guy took, you know, 350000 out of his account after he was done playing. So, like, well, this is a time when this guy doesn't have the capacity to make this kind of money anymore. All of these missteps because of bad information and not understanding. Uh, you know, really what, what's, what's going on from the business side. Definitely, man. And, and that's why when you shared the idea and the concept with me, man, I was, mm -hmm. I was definitely a cheerleader for, you know, saying, man, you got to do this today. Yeah. And Before you say anything else, man, I wanted to personally say thank you, man, because you helped me get the ball rolling on my book, helped me get my ball rolling on my logo, uh, my lawyer, uh, making my business an official trademark company. And uh, man, like that, once we had that talk and we did that first data dump, which I still got these papers sitting right here, um, yeah, right. Man, that, that that started everything, man. So I, bro, I, I appreciate that, man. Right. And uh, I'm very, very thankful, man, and, and excited on top of everything that this process is going now. No, definitely, man. And, and that's what we should do for each other. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, whether you know it or not, like you motivated me indirectly, you know, cause we didn't, you know, cause of your schedule and travel and you being international most of the time throughout the year, like we don't get to talk as often, but just seeing right. you always, uh, uh, just being at a high caliber mentally, you know, you're always, like you say, focused on conditioning, not only your body, but even your, your, your mental capacity and, Absolutely. and just, you always staying sharp kept me sharp. And as we often say, iron sharpens iron. I was iron. That's right. So, and so I do appreciate, you know, you and anytime I'm in Austin, you always opening up your home and yeah. just uh, being a vessel for keeping me on my toes, man. Cause we don't get a lot of people that's around us that want to see you win. So when you get to see those people and you get access to them, because, you know, like I often tell people, a lot of people didn't get to see me from the beginning. 
You got to see when I was Seen sleeping, it. sleeping on the floor in in a weekly. Seen it, man. Listen, I, you 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 even cut me up a couple times too, man. I was like, hey, <laughs> hey, 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 Will Will had it all, man. I mean, look, you you was gonna get into any spot you wanted to get into, cut your hair, man. He, I mean, it was just listen. This guy it was a human Swiss Army knife, man. And it, it bro, and it does, human Swiss Army knife, man. And it doesn't shock me, bro. That I mean that. The level of success and where you are now, man, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, really. No, definitely, man. So as we wrap up, Keith, man, and again, I appreciate you taking time out your schedule. So yeah, yeah, yeah. IBT, you're working on that. Uh, right. uh, I know it's not going to be – I know it's going to be nothing short than phenomenal because it's something that people need. And that's mm-hmm. the thing. And yeah. I often tell people, like, when you find a gaping hole in the marketplace, that's how you become wealthy. That's how you – uh, uh, create opportunities not only for yourself but others around you. Because I'm, I'm, I even was thinking about when we were sitting there talking about it. The opportunities you'll be able to create for other people, whether it's through employment, you're going to literally help change people's family generational wealth because now they'll be able to sustain and keep a lot of that money they have coming in. You're going to be educating them on how to go overseas and be be a lot smarter, be savvier, understand contracts, understand the taxes know that there's going to be a culture barrier. You're going to actually help extend the careers yes, of yes, a lot of those it. players. Like, have you ever sat back and really just thought about that, man? I, you know, I mean, I, I, like I said, man, I, I'll give you a lot of credit for, you know, helping helping get the ball rolling on that. But the more that I've started to write about this and, and get involved and and uh, and really just, like, put my claws in it because my career is coming to an end. So this is this is my baby, you know, that I'm, that I'm really working on. I, I started the grasping and grasping that concept, man, has made me take it that much more serious. So I want this thing to be executed properly. And I want there to be an answer for every, um, any problem that comes up, there's always going to be a solution. So I'm really taking my time with this thing. And I know how important it is because as you said, there's only 450 people, there's only 450 spots in that NBA. Everybody else that's going to play basketball for a living, this information is going to be applicable. So, life changes, man. Yeah. Life changing. Well, Keith, man, I appreciate you today, man. How can people stay in touch with you? I know you got the season coming up. Uh, you got books. I'm pretty sure eventually you're going to be in movies. Uh, <laughs> we got to <laughs> get some documentary listen. about your life, man. The, listen, the book, the book is coming. The book will be here. I mean, I'm, I'm shooting for spring 22. Um, so the book is coming. Uh, Man, email address, aklankford at gmail.com. Uh, Twitter, Keith underscore Langford. Instagram, Keith underscore Langford. Same, Keith Langford underscore, uh, same thing. Uh, man, I'm I'm definitely an open book. Love to communicate, love to build um, with with people that are, are like-minded. So, um, yeah, man, I'm, you know, locking in for the last part of my career, but also open to opportunities um, for at, at the end of it. So I'm excited and uh, – Man, like, uh, very glad that you've helped me um, with this process, man. Very glad to to be on the show and share what I've been able to share, and and looking forward to to more moments like this, man. Definitely, man. And before we go, I don't know if you remember this. I got a lot of stories, man. <laughs> with, uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, do you remember the website I built for you, or I, I was attempting to make for you? Ah, man, I don't, man. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, I don't hey. remember the website, man. Hey. But listen, I do. I do remember this though. It's funny. Maybe you might remember this. I remember, it. man. There was some. This was early on, man. I want to say this is like oh seven, oh eight ish, man. Like right. you link me up with somebody, man. It was like, hey, look, they are gonna give you a little publicity. They're gonna do a little article for you. Oh yeah. <laughs> then, man, I I get the article, man. I'm like, man, it's like nineteen misspelled words in the thing. <laughs> I was like, yo. But then even even at the same but you know what's so crazy though at that point, man, I, I was just excited to have an article written about me. Right, man. right. So I, I was on like I was on that downswing, man. So I was like, hey man, look at this, man, check it out. So <laughs> I mean it's just it's funny, man, just that you know, those stories, man, they are they they build, they, you know, they build, you know, character, they build um, uh, you know, rapport with people, man. And I bro, I, I rock with you. Appreciate that, man. The end of it, man. So I mean, like, like I said, we we've gone from those my new things and you know just doing what you can do in your power to to now like man we're unlocking so much more man and so uh, i this relationship is really special to me bro man likewise man so 
Ladies and gentlemen, Keith Langford, a.k.a. Freeze. Uh, definitely make sure y'all tune in. Uh, uh, phenomenal story, phenomenal journey. I'm extremely excited about not only what he's accomplished, but what he has coming up. Uh, and as I often continue to say, you know, I want to make sure he gets his flowers while I can still present it to him face to face virtually, of course. So, man, Freeze, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, looking forward to seeing the next part of your journey of your life. I know it's going to be nothing short than phenomenal as the first half. And, man, uh, definitely go out there and continue to inspire, man. So thank you. I appreciate it, family. Absolutely. Full-time CEO podcast. My name is Will Roundtree, where we're delivering you the shit they don't tell you about. And I'll see you on the next episode. Peace. <laughs>